Hello everyone and welcome back to the podcast, episode number nine. Uh, today I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful Mr. Tony Knight. Uh, welcome, Tony. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Good morning. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much for coming on board the Late Bloomer Actor podcast. It's an um, awesome pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Now, I have been really, really looking forward to having a chat with you and um, I reckon I've written down so many questions because... Since I've met you and since I've done training with you, your knowledge and everything about acting, and not just acting, but just history and life, et cetera, et cetera, has, has opened me up to so many questions about culture and, and understanding people and, and understanding history, which is wonderful. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to go back to um, where you grew up, where you started from before. You, you, you now live here in Adelaide, but... Where did your journey start? I believe you're a, a Sydney boy. Is that correct? Oh, I'm absolutely Sydney boy. Northern Beaches, born and bred. So I'm like even with an old surfy culture. But uh, working class parents who set themselves broke to send my sisters and myself to uh, private schools. So I went to um, uh, Sydney Grammar. And uh, went, so I had a pretty... So at the age of nine, I was travelling into the city, which is... Uh, I think that does actually change a type of person. I'm noticing it teaching the students at Botanic a little bit. They're compared to t teaching outside of uh, regional South Australia. Um, you know, city kids, if you go into the school at an early age, which I was certainly doing, you become street smart pretty quickly. I mean, you've got to, basically. Mm. You've got to negotiate. Especially in Sydney. Yeah, you've got to negotiate mm. a city and, and all those sort of things go on. So I was, I was very fortunate to go to Sydney Grammar. And then, um, <laughs> then I auditioned for NIDA. Uh, to the acting course, and I, got, I was only 18. I got in. It was the biggest one, a big mistake. I was way too young, uh, and um, at the end of that year, I was dismissed. I mean, the irony is, of course, it had been 10 years later, I've become the head of acting at NIDA, so, uh, mm. you know, which is quite ironic. And then I, uh, then I actually took off. Um, I've always, I was always at that time in my late teens involved in theatre and wanted to go to Hollywood, wanted to go to New York, wanted to go to London. They were all... Classic things for a lot of young people or any artist, really. You hear about everything secondhand, and uh, even though it was quite exciting what was going on in Australia at that time with the uh, the nineteen seventies renaissance of Australian film and theatre, and mm. and I, my cousin was Alex Buzo, so I was very much involved with all that, uh, and that was early Nimrod days. But I I wanted to get overseas. I just wanted to get to London and to New York and and to actually. That was where my dream was. And so I went, but I had to, uh, I went, this is the other part of my strange journey. Um, you know, <laughs> my parents weren't wealthy, wealthy, so I had to earn the money myself to go and afford all this. So I went to sea. I went dredging. Wow. Uh, for about six months. Yeah, that was in New Zealand, but also in outside of, of, of Sydney. Um, this is, look, it's so weird looking back at all that. But yeah, yes, yeah, so I call it my Eugene O'Neill period. But um, I was on, I think this is the late 70s. I was thinking, I was nearly on a thousand a week, you know. And, wow, yeah. back then. Yeah, it was 12, it was, a, there was, shift, it was shift work. Um, it, was hard, it was heavy labour. Um, but I, I, it was certainly an, ex, an experience, basically. Uh, but I don't know, if, yeah, I kind of, I look back at that and go, God, did I really do that? And, um, but I did. And so that actually, that uh, raised the money to go. And uh, so I went and I basically didn't come back for the next five years. Um, so oh, wow. I, was, I went uh, just the States and then, um, then I went to London. I ended up in London and I went to a, a school called the Drama Centre. Yes, sir. I've heard that one. Yeah, I did the director's course there, a very particular type of training, um, of which Pierce Brosman, Michael Fassbinder, Tom Hardy, these are uh, graduates of Drama Centre. So Colin Firth. They're all graduates of Drama Centre, and uh, so it's a very, very particular type of training, which I, I've introduced you to some of it. Um, yes. And then, uh, then I came back. I got, basically, I had the offer. I could have stayed in London, and um, but after five years or so, I was homesick, and I uh, I wanted to come back. And I mean, I'd been back every now and then to visit family and friends, but I was I was mainly living in London. And uh, mm. but I got tired of the weather. I thought if I have to go through one, <laughs> one more English winter, winter, I think I'd go crazy. And uh, so I came back and I started working in Sydney at a place called the Actors Studio or the Actors Centre. And that was then the Nimrod acting classes. Okay. I did that for a few years. 
And then I worked as uh, Rodney Fisher's personal assistant on an, uh, anything that Rodney was doing, which included then the miniseries of Melba. Uh, so I'd worked on that and then a whole lot of other plays. And then I was at a party. This is seriously how it happened. I was at a party down at North Bondi and Kevin Jackson, who was head of acting at NIDA then, uh, came up to me and said, would I be interested in a job? And I looked at Kevin. I went, "Yeah, sure." You know, night out. Did you did you uh, did you laugh I thinking did. back that you know, as an eighteen year old you were a student? Yeah, I did. I mean, I, <laughs> I did. I said, "Kevin, are you sure?" And um, he said, "No." And he mentioned that John Clark and Elizabeth Butcher would really like, would like me to come out. And and the thing about John and, and Elizabeth, even though I'd been thrown out of NIDA, um, I guess they. What was very nice about them and other teachers at night, like George Whaley, they all, all during that time at, uh, when I was in England, they kept in touch with me, and I did see some of them occasionally when they came over. So they always excellent. Yeah, I kind of take that as a sort of like as a that acknowledgement of talent. Going okay, night is not for you, but you've found somewhere else, and we're going to support you. And they did, they did, and uh, especially John, and uh, John Clark, and. Um, so that was actually really nice to have that sort of support. So when I went in for my interview, it was like meeting old friends and, uh, and having a great conversation. And I was offered the job then and then to work as an acting wow. teacher. And then- Isn't it funny, um, we were, I was talking on my last episode with Andy McPhee, um, which was titled Sliding Doors. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how doors open or close in someone's journey. And, um, and, that, and that's funny, in your case, you, you've had a door closed only to, uh, uh, to offer an opening later on, isn't it? Well, very much so. And I often think, mm. what would have happened if I didn't come back to Australia? What, mm. what, what sort of career would have, I have had over in England, for example, um, or even in America? But, I, but you're absolutely right. Sliding doors. I think it's a, mm. and always being ready for the opportunity. I think it's very important to always remain positive. It's very difficult. And you never know where an opportunity may present itself. So I, Definitely. Tend to, I tend to say yes more than no, actually, and encourage others to go, just take the risk. Now, I don't want to focus, well, I, I do want to focus a lot on your NIDA because that just thoroughly um, interests me about your journey there. So um, you were there for 21 years, is that 24, correct? 24 years. 24, and the head of NIDA for... Um, 10 or 12? No, no. I, I became head of NIDA in 1992 and I yes. left in, in 2011. Okay. So. Oh, that's a, and so I just wanted to touch on, could you tell me about your, your journey there? Um, obviously, and, and we're going back to, you, you said just before about, oh my God, how different would my life be if I hadn't come back to Australia? But how many actors have you been involved with the journeys that you've um, touched on there? Uh, journey through NIDA, so that would change it. How, how did you influence a lot of um, actors in NIDA and, and what did you see coming out of that? Well, I always think when I talk about NIDA, I always remind people it, it's not just me. It, NIDA then, not now, but NIDA then, we were gathered together as an ensemble of teachers um, and that included acting teachers as well as design teachers, technical production teachers. And so you had a, a teaching program which you did it during the day and we all worked together, and then, and then you had a play production program in the afternoon, of which all the departments then came together. So in many mm. ways it was actually operating a little bit like a, an acting ensemble or a, a theatre ensemble, the training. Um, uh, what I brought in was, a, I guess you'd call the method, and, but also all the issues of uh, a European training and history of theatre. So there was, but there were, that was sort of like complementary to voice and movement and music and a whole lot of other things. Um, what was one of the biggest changes that for me, when I, especially when I took over, um, when I started at NIDA, the amount of film and television training that the actors had was like two weeks with the ABC. That was it. Wow. That was at the end mm -hmm. of their third year. There wasn't anything else. And then talking to graduates, and this included Hugo Weaving. I'm not, I know I'm name dropping, but you know, but a whole lot of people. Nothing wrong with that. Saying, going, well, what, what, what do you need? What do we need to do here to improve the training? And it was always more film and television, more film and television. And that's kind of understandable, as it still is now, because uh, the majority of work in Australia for Australian actors is in film and television, not in professional theatre. I mean, it's changing mm. a little bit. Professional theatre has certainly expanded, especially the musicals. Um, <coughs> but I th it still is the case there's more work in film and television than there is in professional theatre. 
I mean, certainly here we have, which is much as I, I really do admire, and I do admire Mitchell Patel enormously, is um, the very fact that there's only one professional adult company in Adelaide is problematic, and um, mm. because it only means that the company, good though a duck is, it can only employ a certain amount of actors, and that's just. That's why there's a brain drain, and I just think that's a problem. But anyway, so back to NIDA. So that's what I resolved to do. Talking with John Clark, um, it was one of these, one, one issue of going, we've got to increase the amount of film and television training in it. Now, look, initially, there was a lot of resistance to this. Um, there, there was the thing about the attitude, oh, well, theatre training is just as, you know, if you train for the theatre, you can do film and television. I'm going, well, no, that's not true. And uh, and then listening to people like Meryl Streep talk about how she's knowledgeable about lenses and camera angles and the whole technique of understanding uh, filmmaking. Uh, and um, so I just started adding more, basically, just getting you know, working mm. with John saying, OK, we... We've got the two weeks. What do we add another two weeks somewhere? What do I add more here? And so gradually over so many years, I just kept adding more and more things uh, to the film and television training so that by the time I left, it was about a third of the training. And uh, I think that's probably about right. You wouldn't want it to be a bit more than that. But within that, it wasn't just involving acting for the camera. Like for the first exercise that the, the uh, first-year students actually did was make your own film. So they would learn. Awesome. That. So they would go out there and storyboard and um, cast, write the script themselves. And these are like short three minute films. And then they would learn how to work on Final Cut Pro. Uh, and because my attitude then was, and, and this is advice from directors such as um, uh, Nick Parsons, to go let them first learn about the camera from the other side of the camera. Let them learn about the whole process rather than mm. acting for the camera. So it was a holistic approach. And I kind of went, yeah, absolutely, let's do that. And then uh, in the second year, uh, this was always when George Whaley was up at the Australian Film and Television Radio School, uh, they did exercises with the film students up there, so establishing that relationship. Um, but there was a lot more other things. There were soundtrack exercises, post-syncing exercises, uh, also just getting in front. And really, as um, Hugo Weaving said, I've never forgotten what Hugo said about just get them in front of the camera. Because partly, uh, Hugo did a lot of these series, like the Dirtwood Dynasty and a whole lot of series, simply because one reason why he did a lot back to back was um, because of the lack of experience that he had in front of a camera. And just like mm. you work on stage uh, with all the drama training that goes on, you you develop a confidence to work in the theatre. Um, by just simply repetition. But the same is true for working in front of a camera. You've got to uh, keep doing it in order to find, to, just to be able to relax in front of it, especially in a professional environment when there's so many other things going on. You've got to stay pretty mm. calm when it goes action and just do it. And uh, Yeah, certainly. I, I listened to a podcast the other day, uh, and I've forgotten the actor, but he said uh, he applied and he did his the three years at Whopper. But his sister... Um, uh, tried to do the same approach, but she actually got a role on Home and Away and so went full-time with Home and Away and she did uh, several years on Home and Away and that was her drama training because she was um, high focus and high intensity camera work all the time. And so she's walked away with the same skill set that he got at three years at um, drama school, um, but in a paid environment because she's in front of the camera all, all the time. So that makes such a big difference. There is that the problem with, with I mean, I agree with you, she'd be far more skilled regarding film and television, three camera setups and a whole lot of different things, but can she work in the theatre? That's going to be the truth, mm. because what we often see, and I talked to a lot of people who came from the world of soap opera, came to NIDA, because they actually, that period of their life was over, and unfortunately how it works, sometimes that can be the end of a career completely, and so, wow. uh, then, so you need to come back to the theatre which is the lifeblood, and, uh, and that does involve different techniques. And a lot, of, a lot of film actors get very nervous about coming back to the theatre because they've basically lost certain 
technical skills like voice in particular. They don't have the mm. perfect strength of the voice and immediately, oh, I'm going to be mic'd anyway, which I always think is a dreadful argument. And um, <laughs> so, uh, and you know, the whole b way you work on a stage compared to working, you, how you physically work on a stage compared to working on a studio, there are differences, massive differences, usually mm. associated with the issue of scale, of how big you can go and issues of nervousness with truth and because sometimes you're working, working in the theatre, you can go, oh, I feel like I'm overacting. You go, no, you're not. I can hardly hear you, you know. So, uh, well, so that, that sort of works like um, with the pilot training, if you want to go and get your pilot's licence. If they say, um, if you want to be a pilot of a plane and you want to be a pilot of a helicopter, they say, go and get the helicopter licence first and then go back to learning how to fly a plane. Would that, in the world of acting, would you say get, get your theatre background first and then do film and TV? I would. I would, actually. Mm. And, and you can nev and never lose either skill. So basically, you go to classes if, as much as you possibly can to experience mm. both. Um, voice classes in particular, I'm amazed at that because the quality... I mean, you've got a great voice, David, but you know, you're lucky. Oh, thank you. You know, because most people don't. <laughs> so, and they don't... And it has to be trained. And... Because uh, mm. otherwise it gets really boring to listen to. And so... It's well, it's interesting because I always thought of got a terrible voice but I've been told that I'm quite articulate and well spoken and whether that's something to do with my 30 years in the job that I do um, and I've had negatives of that because I've done roles where I'm speaking too clearly where I need to you know change it so I can see how voice is is a big thing it's interesting isn't it yeah and also knowing yourself you, you keep yourself physically fit don't you so you know, you've, got, you've got that. You've got that. No, well, you've got that discipline, which is an, what mm. an actor needs. You know, is to actually take mm. care. I was just talking to young people the other day about this, saying, and others going, "This is all you've got. You don't really have anything else except your body. So you've actually got to look after it, uh, on on physically and vocally and health wise and all sort of things. Uh, mm. You know, it's very important. And I kind of just talking even on on a mental health issue and expanding your imagination. It's all actually very physically orientated. So, and as you know, sometimes to deal with stress, a, a good workout at a gym is actually the best thing to do if you're feeling stressed. Definitely. Yeah. I just want to touch on uh, the point that you said there about uh, the, having that stage training um, and, uh, and ideally having it first. Now, if we look at my um, situation or um, you know, the late bloomer situation where actors might not have done drama at school and they've got into acting and so it's pretty much film and TV. Uh, is it possible to go back and do the, um, the stage later on? If you look at my circumstances, um, I'm looking forward to retirement in um, 10 years' time. So then I'll be in a position where I can actually do um, stage. At the moment, I can't. The rehearsals just don't work in with my lifestyle. Yeah. Is it never too late to, to jump up on stage and, and learn the craft? Late. Yeah, it's never too late. Never, ever. It's always possible to get in there. And, you know, look, the funny thing is we get older. You kind of don't want the leading roles. You kind of go, oh, no? <laughs> I'm fine to play the butler and because uh, I don't have that many lines to learn and I'm quite happy with all that. I've, I've heard that with a lot of senior <laughs> actors going, yeah, just that, that you go for these particular roles, let the young people have the leading things and you just actually work as a support. Yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm going out mm. to see... Um, uh, next week, I'm going out to see uh, to the Tea Tree Players because they're doing one of my favourite plays. They're doing Arsenic and Old Lace, and um, wow. which is a great play. And uh, and so that's going to be full of of senior actors, which you don't really get to mm. see very often in or even on on a professional stage. You, the seniors tend to disappear, but then Arsenic and Old Lace demands it, and uh, so I'm looking actually forward to seeing that. And I know it, it'll mm. be an amateur group, and it'll be, but they'll be all up there actually working on this wonderful play and the thing is about all that is i've noticed because i've been helping with a couple of other groups as well um it's the issue of style and understanding that because we're dominated by naturalism absolutely dominated by it and they uh and i find that a lot of people are fine at doing naturalism it's really quite easy modern naturalism but when you give them anything heightened like a heightened comedy or um like a coward or even like this crazy play could ask like an old lace um, people start to fumble and go and you go okay what was something's really missing here and the theater will do this this is what the mm. by being, coming back to your question is theater more than uh, film and television will give you an appreciation of style and what do I mean by that well by style I mean it's sort of like there's imaginary worlds I mean Shakespeare's got a style, for example and uh, 
even though they're in massively different plays. But it has a particular challenging demand that you, you can't bring it down to naturalism. You've got to reach up for it because it's got a, a far more expanded universe, expanded way of thinking. And it's the same thing with any doing... Like even doing a David Williamson. David, David Williamson's plays are actually very tricky. They're technical because mm. they're very long sentences. That you, it's not like normal speaking. You've got to. Do, it feels like it, but you've got to drive through these things. And um, it's quite complicated. So that what I noticed within the theatre, especially the community theatre in Adelaide, that's where you get a chance to to experience different styles. And I think that's really important, very important, because you want to be able to have a versatility and skills to go. Okay, I'm going to do a fast this week then I'm going to do a drama, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that. Because otherwise you just end up playing one thing. Mm -hmm. and that so that, that draws on the, um, the classical background of um, acting, uh, acting teachers, and which is what you, you've done all your life. Um, so you still think that uh, you need that regardless, or can actors not have that oh, and, and still wing it? You, you, know, you could, of course, you don't have to have it. But or good, but to we're talking about the difference between do, are you doing acting as a commercial product or is you doing it as mm. an art form? And I always go, mm. look, in order to avoid uh, disappointment uh, and uh, bitterness, stay with the art. Just the, whenever a decision comes along, go with the art form because as we know, and I've, I've been through this. If you the, just, the jobs you've done just for the money are always the ones that are hideous basically, mm. and, ne and never give you the satisfaction. Whereas the ones that you do for art, that you might not really see, receive many much, much money, they can sometimes be the most rewarding experiences of all. And the, mm. and the because it, a film and TV now, a lot of it's changed to more character-based things. So, I mean, the, the casting agents are grabbing people off the street because they're going for that look. You know, the Breaking Bad was a big change in, in uh, streaming shows, for example, a step away from the classic blonde hair, blue eyes, actor. Yeah. Um, do you see that as a positive for TV and film? Because oh, you, you no. wouldn't see it on stage, of course. But... Oh, no, God, no. Well, you can. It's usually disastrous. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, a, a TV person will, will go, oh, I want to be in a, do, do a stage show, and they just don't have the technical skills to do it. Mm. And it's really noticeable. Um, no, it's interesting you bring this up because um, Quentin Tarantino, for example, is uh, just recently was... Somewhere, I read this somewhere. Um, the French New Wave in the 1960s, which is Truffaut and a whole lot of other people, Bresson, they, they were the ones that brought in this idea of grabbing people from the street and, and turning them into actors who had no formal training. And look, for the things that they did, it worked. It was actually quite like 400 blows, and that's all really impressive. But as Tarantino points out, it doesn't actually mean that they're actors. You know, mm. it means that they're actually being manipulated by a film director to provide one one performance that's actually stunning, but then what are they like in the next show? And it's always that it's always don't judge an actor by just one show. You've got to, an actor is somebody who's you know. Let's talk about if you're a real actor. Let's talk about how many shows you've done. Five films. It's not. It's always about the next job. Basically, you've always got mm. to keep thinking, what's the next job? What's the next job? What I'm going to go for? And that's partly the definition of an actor, and that can be anything. But um, I, I, Tarantino's very down on that whole thing of, of pulling actors off the street. He, um, okay. And this whole thing. It's, all, it's almost a, a reality TV. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, mainstream TV is so full of reality TV now. And they're stars for a day, but then we never see them again. That's so that's pretty much what you're leaning towards, isn't it? Yeah, you, you've, it's not the first job, it's the second. Can you get the second job? And the the film in particular is littered with people who've suddenly had a who've gone right up there and been major considered major stars and they're nothing, mm. nothing at all. So you were you were talking about the the, the building that foundation, so to speak, uh, which is great. Well, most of the drama schools still teach that foundation of acting, don't oh, yeah. they? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, you're reminded continue with all the not all of them, but. Uh, because there are schools that specialise now in just film and television, which is understandable. But uh, mm. but the best drama schools always are stage related. Have that as because that's that's your lifeblood. And when film and television dries up, what do you do? You go back to the theatre. Mm. That's it's because it's always going to be there. Always. So, what's your thoughts on on the older actors? Um, I think we started to touch on that before about 
where can they get that foundation if they're not doing the solid three years at drama school? I mean, I've done a couple of little courses with you and it slowly builds. It can be done, can't it? Oh, yeah, and I encourage people to do as many different courses as possible because I, 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 I don't want to ever be regarded as... I hate when I'm called a mentor. I just I really hate that. And I just go, go and find out, go, go and do Nick's classes, go and do those pieces of classes. Find out as many different techniques as you possibly can because I don't believe there's just one technique. I believe that there's actually multiple mm. techniques and you, and you grow and you learn and you develop your own technique. This was actually the training at NIDA, which I put together, is it wasn't just one, one technique. I tried to expose the students to as many different techniques over the three years and encourage them, you form your own technique. And so I do believe that that's what uh, any professional actor or any actor really basically should be going and seeking out new techniques. Um, uh, one, one just recently, because she's, she's a mate. I mean, Corinna De, De Niro, who is one of uh, is a brilliant commedia dell'arte teacher in is in Adelaide, and Corinna occasionally does um, uh, workshops. I'd be going, go and do them, go and do a mm. go and do a commedia workshop, um, because it'd be fantastic. It's, it's so brilliant an art form, and it's specialised. So I, it's those things, whether it be classical, whether it be modern. Um, I just noticed there's coming up a big drama. I won't be able to go to it, but there's a big drama conference coming up for teachers. Um, and it's interesting, the speakers, they've got theatre games, talking about different approaches to classrooms. I'd love to be able to go to see some of it because it'll, there'll be always new things evolving. Um, mm. There's this new thing now, they're talking about cine theatre because of the success of uh, the picture of Dorian Gray and at the moment at the Sydney Theatre Company they're doing Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. And this is this thing, of, I don't know if you saw... Um, picture of Dorian Gray. It was pretty good. I mean, one single actress and multiple screens. So it was a theatrical experience. Wow. A combination no. of theatre, very successful combination of theatre and film with camera people live on stage. Um, and that's, a, that's not necessarily new. It actually had been existing for a hundred years, this combination of theatre and film. But there, there's what's going on with the Sydney Theatre Company at the moment. They're, they're honing in on a very, very particular skill and uh, and how do you work with a camera person on stage with 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 film and wow. theatre combining? And so so you've got to always be aware that there's new techniques coming forward. I'll tell you one thing I've noticed also just regarding regarding the method I teach is um, we used to talk about motivation a lot. You don't necessarily talk about motivation as much anymore. Um, it's more about motivation the, of the actor or motivation of the character. Motivation of the character. Um, you'll talk about backstory, which I always hate, but anyway, you talk, but uh, you talk, it, it's more about play the moment and sometimes, mm. and not worry about actually why you're doing them, why you're doing it, but just simply play that second. Now, look, I think there's thing, good things and bad things about it, but I certainly understand what they, what it means. Cause I know that I'll, I'll, in rehearsal, and even when I'll, I know I'll be doing this today, I'll be talking about play the moment. Just play that moment of connecting between two characters or as many characters as you like, rather than not worrying about other things. Um, mm. And so it's searching for those things. And I've, it's just developed a little bit over those. So the plays, for example, you deal with motivation a lot, like Chekhov, Tennessee Williams, you talk about motivation and all those heavy pieces of naturalism. That, there's a different type of playwriting going on at the moment. Plus we're actually in a, a new world regarding characters, um, which I... I personally find it some sometimes hard to get my head around um non-binary trans there's a whole different way of actually using pronouns uh mm. which is to be expected sometimes and you know to be honest i always turn around and say listen i'm a baby boomer i'm going to get it wrong so you just got to help me through this to, if you, and because i know that a lot of rehearsals now in professional as well as in drama schools you begin with actually well how do you want to be addressed um, mm. You want to be called him, her, they, what, whatever. And uh, there's a controversial play on it in London at the moment called I, Joan, which is about Joan of Arc. It's attracting a lot of controversy uh, because it's presenting Joan as non-binary, St. Joan. And people okay. say, you know, you know, this is the patron saint of France who was a... Did she have visions from God? I mean, who knows? Anyway, but it's actually... But I kind of go, and I've been reading through it. I was just reading through it this morning, and I'm going, because Peter Brooks said that actually a good sign of theatre is when you have people who love it and when you have people who hate it. Same with a good film. If you've got, mm. that, if you've got that difference, then you're, going to have diff then you're going to have discourse about people who love something and hate it. So it's the ideal reaction 
that you want is you know, that type of polarisation, people who love it and people who hate it, because then they're going to talk, rather than go, mm. OK, well, where are we going to go to supper? And you forget about the experience immediately. Mm. Oh. So you were talking just before about uh, character, about being in the moment, <laughs> and um, one of the teachers that I love and I follow uh, is Jeff Seymour, uh, a.k.a. the real-life actor, and, and he talks about that, about being in the moment. He uses an example, um, I think it was a story or a play or a movie uh, about some uh, tribes in Africa where you've got two tribes or two different clans and one of the, the, the two leaders had grown up together um, but were in separate clans now and the other clan had taken the other gentleman's son and was going to kill him. And so in this scene, um, he was going to try and argue and try and get his son back to save his son's life. And the actor that was doing the scene went through all these motions um, the night before, how he was going to do it and drawing on colours or what animal is he playing and everything like that. And Jeff sort of talks around and says, well, no, you, be the father. You're the father and you're standing there and this man's about to kill your son. How are you going to react? You're not going to think about it. You're going to react. Is that what you were leaning towards? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the funny thing is, when we work in the theatre and in film, uh, everything's meant to be, inst we've got to, it's, we rehearse it and we practice it, we learn our lines, mm. we go through a very self-conscious process. But in the end, we've got to make it appear spontaneous. We've got to make it appear organic, that it's actually happening mm. for the first time. And sometimes that's actually more important. So I do turn around. I completely agree. It's like, that's why I worry about actors doing backstories sometimes, because I can't go, where did you get that choice? And actually, it's mm. irrelevant. Play the moment, you know? The and that's the hardest thing as an actor is learning how to do that. And, and that's where your so. training comes up. And having that toolbox that you're talking about, we can go through Myers and we can do Stella Adler or Chubbuck. Or, I mean, you've even mentioned some today that I've never heard of. So uh, it's not about picking or choosing. It's about having a knowledge of, of one or, or a hundred. And having a toolbox to work on, is that correct? Absolutely, I think the operative word, and I know this is very much a part of my training, is play. Give yourself permission to play. Uh, so, because if without a sense of play, uh, you won't ex explore different choices. But sometimes you've got to be disciplined, you've got to create your play yourself. So that's why I use that term, give yourself permission to play. Don't mm. wait for a director or another actor to give you that permission. You need to find that within yourself going, and you're an actor, you know, just muck around, you know. And do it. Just do it. And, uh, <laughs> but it's amazing how you've got to kind of say, as I said, that give yourself permission to play because actors worry about, am I doing, am I okay? Am, am I doing it right? Is this the right thing to do? And all actors worry about this. And, um, and usually it is, it's an issue of confidence. Um, but I do think that playing and finding variations in what you're doing, technically I can say variations in pitch, pace and volume just on a vocal level, or variations in actions is what is on an, also on a technical level. That's all there. That's, that, that's all on a technical level. But um, ultimately, did you see that wonderful thing um, that Meryl Streep did, uh, improvising the telephone conversation for um, Don't Look Up? They, they screened it. I heard about that, and they didn't know what she was doing. No. Well, she they, just went with it. Yeah, she just gave about, you know, she just started improvising. Um, mm. completely unscripted, it was brilliant. And they mm. just kept the camera rolling. And, uh, and she did so, she offered so many different variations fucking around. I think that's actually really important. That was like a really great acting lesson to watch is just a lot, because she was playing, you know, mm. she was just mucking around. She, interesting though, she was a fair, watching her, she was um, quite away from the camera. She was up against the back wall of the set um, because this was only just going to be a sort of like a, a grab. It wasn't necessarily going to be something that's goes, but because it was so interesting to watch her improvising on a phone. Um, it worked. It worked, yeah. And uh, wow. you just saw that. Now, I, I believe that anybody can do what Meryl Streep did with that. Anybody can do that. That can be, that's just sheer having the guts and mucking around and playing and giving yourself permission to play. Uh, to mm. find the variation on certain things. So, and I know within my rehearsals, and I hope in my acting classes, but particularly my rehearsals, I believe it's got to have a, and, you know, in some of the film studios sets I've worked on with, like Aaron with um, uh, 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 Warpath. Warpath. Yeah, yep. Aaron was great. 
Alan was terrific, you know, and the sense of actually the playfulness that he can actually create on set. And he kind of, that's why I'm, I'm happy to work with Aaron again, because it's just fun. And he makes, mm. he makes it, he, but at the same time, you know, very clearly he knows what he wants, but he actually encourages you to play. And uh, that was just a wonderful experience. And so I do think that's the most important thing, permission to play. I love it. And, and Meryl Streep, everyone says that she is such a wonderful actress, and she is. But I've heard so many stories about that where she just goes and just and just runs with it and has fun. So it, does that, that makes her the great actress she is, I suppose. Also remembering Meryl Streep did come up through New York. Like she is a stage actor. Mm. And we'll go back mm. to the theatre when she can. As a lot of those New Yorker actors are like Robert, no, not so much Robert De Niro, but certainly Al Pacino. And mm. uh, they're all New Yorkers. So they all came up through a particular, a particular type of training. They don't live in Hollywood, you know. I, I Fair enough. Yeah. Mm. And so um, you're a, a great proponent of um, Shakespeare and, um, and Shakespeare is part of your classic training and classic stage. And I've had a discussion with you that um, I, I lack a little bit of culture, that I haven't had a, a lot of exposure to Shakespeare at school or, or in my acting. And I saw Midsummer Night's Dream for the first time in um, Tasmania when I was down there with my wife, Kelly. Oh. And I loved it. So how much do you think um, actors should try and get Shakespeare in their knowledge or, or even as, even on stage and play it? Does it help? How does oh, it change it, you as an actor? Everything, because everything, it's about the poetry and it's about mm. the, and finding that poetry within yourself, allowing the language to just fly with you because there's nothing like Shakespeare's language. Once you get inside it and allow it in, um, you start touching on something that's actually quite sublime and beautiful and you realise the possibility, the imaginative possibilities that are, are bigger than naturalism, for example. I mean, and the Midsummer Night's Dream is one of the great plays. I mean, it's hilarious. And, um, you know, there's a beauty in it and so a grace, an audacity and a boldness that you don't necessarily get from a lot of naturalism. So you start mm. thinking of yourself in a very, as a poet, I guess, as there, there is something, and I do believe actors are poets. And the other thing about, uh, it's appreciating words. I mean, I've, with the young people I talk to, and I'm working with Shakespeare at the moment, I'm going, if you don't love words, then you will never be an actor. Because your whole life as an actor is going to be involving words. I mean, a lot of other things as well, but mm. essentially it's going to be looking at a script, being interpreting, how do I get that word to work? How am I going to colour that word? And Shakespeare can help you learn that skill of that appreciation of rhythm, uh, which is the I'm being temp and a whole lot of other crap you don't, you know. But, it's the, um, but it is the appreciation of words, of, of the power of language. And Shakespeare's the best. I mean, it's mm. not to say that other people aren't good. I mean, Tennessee Williams, I love. Also, the, there's a poet of the theatre, Arthur Miller. Um, you know, there's these great poets of the theatre that actually are wordsmiths. Mm. And that's, what, that's why learning the classical theatre, one reason is that it's the issue of language, of how language actually can influence us in communicating and, and expressing things on a, on a massive scale, uh, which is much bigger than sort of like home and away. You know, um, so, um, because if you've got if you've got a really really good script, so Shakespeare or just something really written well, you can have a bad actor do it and it still be watchable and still be enjoyable. But you can't go the other way around. If you've got a really really bad script, it doesn't matter how good the actor is. And we've seen movies done before where you've just gone that was crap and it was because you know it was written crap and the great actor could do nothing with it yeah look, I, I, watched, I watched something the other night um with colin firth who i think is a really terrific actor it's a new mm. movie involving a second world war i better not say what it is i just went what the hell is this you know because it was boring and um you know i mean i read the reviews and they've been, they've been okay but i just thought i couldn't i just could not get into this thing at all and um mm. uh, but, but look, I, I do think it's horses for courses a little bit. I, I mean, I loved everywhere, everything, and all at once. But I know people, um, some people who hated it. And it's, <laughs> um, and it's the same with um, Stranger Things. I mean, I watched Stranger Things partly because I'm teaching that age group. And, I just, yes. and, they, and they're talking about it. But I, got, I really enjoyed it. And then I watched uh, The Umbrella Academy. But then you meet other people, including young people, who absolutely hate it. And I think mm. this touches on another thing about acting, and it's the issue of the imagination 
and that we talk about actors in highly emotive terms. We talk about the theatre, we talk about film in highly emotive terms. I love that actor or I hate that film and things like that. And we all use those types of words in describing the art form. And you kind of go, well, why do we do that? And uh, why, is, why, is, why do we talk about it in emotive terms? We don't know these people really. And, uh, and yet we say we kind of behave as if we do. Even talking about a, mm. you know, the character of Macbeth, for example, the, like Denzel Washington, the latest ones with um, Denzel Washington. And um, we talk about them as if we know them and we don't really. And I think it's got a lot to do with the issue of the power of the imagination and how that certain actors and certain films, certain tele some we're going to love some and we're not going to, and others we're not. Our imaginations mm. aren't going to fire. So I think it's a highly selective process, and it's not a sort of like one one solution or one box fits all. I think it's it's quite variety. There's a big variety. I I I I don't particularly like horror films, for example. But I'll watch them, but I, I don't particularly like them. Um, Fair enough. And so that's what I mean about this. They don't do anything for my imagination. Whereas my sister, um, one of my sisters, like they hate the Marvel films. They just would never watch any of the Marvel films. I, I struggle with Marvel and uh, Connor, my son, he'll, he'll hear this and go, Dad! But um, I, I just can't keep up with them is one of the things. And it's just the same, I feel it's the same thing over and over. Yeah, I, I'm trying to. It's good. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Basically, mm. it just goes on. I'm getting back into westerns, which is and they're coming back too in a, in a different way. It's a it's a new genre in itself, almost. Yeah, I was I was teaching a class the other day, and their knowledge about the western was sort of like Westworld. Really, I'm going. Mm. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about John Ford and the Searchers and Stagecoach and the whole format because it's a very American form. But mm. the western is actually like Australians do western. The dry could be regarded as a western. True. Um, mm. um, and we because anything are basically said in the outback. And so how the western has grown as a genre uh, is really fascinating. And yes, it, mm. it's interesting how the western drops out of favour and then comes back. And uh, mm. it's quite fascinating. Are we, uh, I like. I, I don't mind the superhero films. I wish just, just wish they weren't so bloody long, because you know, like three hours of going. Okay, you know, and you know, but interesting actors, especially the the mm. Avengers. I mean, they're, you know, Robert Downey Jr. and you know, like they're all terrific actors having a ball. Definitely. And I'm mm. and Kate Blanchard in uh, Ragnarok was hilarious. So. Um, but I, they are very long. But that's why everywhere and everything and all at once, I just thought that was one of the most imaginative films I've seen in ages. But I do know other people who hated it. Mm. So, and it's funny with the, um, you were saying the Westerns, uh, that it's also a big thing in sci-fi now, even though it's science fiction, they, it's got that Western feel and the Western tone to it. So yeah. it seems to be a building thing. Uh, Tony, I want to, just step away from acting just a little bit. And I brought this up at the start of the podcast, but um, in discussions with you and over time that I've, since I've met you, I'm always amazed that your knowledge of history, particularly Australian history, and and I'm almost embarrassed at times by the lack of my knowledge in so many areas of Australian history. And you've mentioned how many people don't know their own history, even in their city that they live in. And you've talked about Adelaide, for example, and Adelaide's only one city, but and it's the same in every city how many people don't know the history of where they live. In particular, you've brought up like statues, that there's so many statues in a city and we walk past them every day and we don't know who these people are. Where have you learnt all this? What's made you have such a great understanding of that? And does, does that affect your teaching and, and your acting? Do you think we need to know a lot more about our history for that? Well, I think history is associated with um, national identity as well as uh, patriotism. Um, you know, and I'm a proud Australian, and I'm now a proud of South Australian because it's actually uh, it's associated with the land, and uh, just as what you listen to Indigenous people talk about the importance um, of Indigenous culture, which I completely agree with and support, and we need mm. to know a lot more about that, and the way that language is coming into our schooling. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so that's a whole process that's that's just beginning. But I but white culture is also European culture is also quite important here, and I um I don't think that should be dismissed, even though there's a whole lot of things involving colonialism uh, that is not particularly admirable. But let's say a little bit clear of that. Let's just deal with the history of theatre and the history of um the history of Australian theatre and the history of Australian film, which is absolutely brilliant, 
and mm. um, and there are so many fantastic actors and I mean one story I love talking to you South Australians about is how did Semaphore get its name and you have this man called George Coppin who called himself the, Australian, the father of Australian theatre and he built the Queen's Theatre in, in the city and Coppin had the, had the pub out at a Semaphore and Semaphore of course is associated with the signals but um, it was called something else then but it, the original signing came from Coppin's pub because then he would use, he'd see a ship coming in and then he would sing, send, send off uh, uh, signals to his pubs and his theatre in town. That's, wow. So that's how it actually, so Coppin actually becomes, <laughs> names the suburb of Singapore, of, of, of Semaphore. And um, so it's little stories like that. And of course, one I've talked about um, uh, in the statue in Hindley Street, there's this, uh, this statue of this entertainer called Roy Reen. And I always bring it up is how many people have walked by and said, they all know the statue. They all know, they've all seen it because it's uh, quite an iconic thing. And then I go, well, who is it? And uh, that's when you get stuck and I get told things like, which I love it, uh, oh, it's an, old, it's an old bum that the city fathers took pity on. But this is actually, <laughs> you know, our greatest clown. And he's looking at across at the place where he was born in Hindley Street. And, uh, and it's, what I find with the young, especially with the young ones, they just need to be guided and go, okay, well, that's who he is. And then they'll find out about Roy Reen. And there's lots and lots of others, lots and lots of others. I mean, you mentioned about statues. I am a little bit obsessed with statues. I, I, there's a, the huge argument about tearing down some of them. To be honest with you, tear down the ones of Queen Victoria. They're always so boring. You know, <laughs> She always looks so sad and depressed, and I'm not a big mm. fan of Victoria anyway. But there's a couple of public statues that are uh, the three oldest ones in Adelaide. Uh, the oldest one is um, is the Canova Venus outside um, Government House, and this is this caused a scandal at the time. You could write, you could write. The thing about all this sort of stuff is you can create plays and films about it all. Uh, because it's mm. stories, and so when they re when they revealed the Canova Venus, I mean there was an outcry because she's half naked, and um, and it was all it was a big scandal and things like that. But then I go a little bit further regarding art and things like that. What's extraordinary about the Canova Venus is a it's you know it's 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 a Canova statue, and Canova is next to Michelangelo in the world of art and uh, regarding statues, and it's amazing. But that, what that statue has seen over the last hundred odd years, people have doused it with petrol and set it alight. Wow. It's had, you kind of look, it's got hats on it often, or scarves. And <laughs> it's, but it's been there as a silent witness, if you like, with the history of Adelaide since 1892. It's been a constant presence uh, in that. So I think you could create a whole play about this, that this statue has always been there. Um, mm. And what's mar remarkable about it artistically is it's the Statue of Venus stepping from a bath and being surprised by something. But it doesn't tell you what, you, what she's being surprised by. That's up to you in your imagination to work out. So I love... Awesome. The, um, mm. One of the other ones is outside of the, uh, the football stadium. It's um, of uh, Hercules, Hercules Verens. I think that's the second oldest. And then, the, then there's the, the, the Boer War statue. Um, that's, they're the three oldest uh, statues in Adelaide, and they're, wow. I think they're all terrific. And, and they've all got little things about them that are really important. I mean, you know, fascinate me, because I'm weird, is uh, I mean, <laughs> the base, for example, of the Boer War statue. I mean, the statue itself was designed by an Englishman, but the base uh, is uh, from Murray Bridge, and that's actually one of the first ever statues that came from the country uh, regarding sandstone base, for, especially from Murray Bridge. And it's those little details you go, those little firsts. I do talk about also um, Australian, uh, South Australian poets like C.J. Dennis, mm. uh, who came from Auburn with the sentimental bloke. I mean, and look, Hans Heysen. I mean, Hans Heysen up at Harndorf, and you can actually go to the place where he did all his marvellous works and then wow. the story about Hans Heysen. Um, who's one of my favourite painters. And look, that, that art gallery of South Australia is actually a fantastic art gallery. It's got so many wonderful things and, uh, and constant new things. So you, you can always... People talk about, you know, say about Adelaide's very conservative, is, but, or Adelaide's very boring. And I go, well, you should get out more. Because <laughs> You've said that. Mm. You know, Adelaide's not boring. You can always do... There's always something on, always. I mean, and, and, and 
Yeah, I, I, so I always think that you've just got to... I'm a, I'm a bit like this with any city I've lived in, getting involved in the history and wanting to know more about it, at good and bad, because there is good and mm. bad. I mean, the colonials, the colonials, you know, it's a pretty... It's not... Well, across the entire country, it's pretty bad regarding the treatment of ab Aboriginals. It's dreadful mm. everywhere. But I also... Uh, there's parts of South Australia... South Australia is quite stunning in its... Uh, in its landscapes and this majestic beauty. And Alex, I'm writing a forward for Alex Frayne's new book on landscapes and Alex is a friend and a mentor and the way he photographs the South Australian landscape, it has a majestic beauty, but it's also quite haunting. And But mm. Alex never judges it. He also like, which I like about his work, there's not a sort of like a, a moralistic thing saying, this is beautiful or anything, this is bad. It's, um, there's a, there's quite a, a haunting quality in his work, which I think captures what the South, what a lot of South Australia is like, especially when you go into the really uh, remote areas, with, up into the Flinders Ranges. I mean, it's there's this extraordinary beauty about it all um, mm. that is not like what you find when you go to New South Wales or Queensland or through Victoria. It's very, very South Australian, and uh, and I quite love all of this, to be honest. I find it's. I, I guess I'm, I'm coming around to question because there's always a mystery. I guess there's a mystery. It's trying to understand what is the what is the soul of this place? What is the spiritual essence? And um and it's usually in the land, basically, and in the mm. topography. I mean, Matthew Flinders thought the 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 the, the, the land from um, Adelaide to uh, Melbourne was the uh, most rugged coastline in the entire world. And there's about six hundred shipwrecks out there. Between, wow! Yeah, of which we've only got about three hundred, but there's, mm. there's massive amounts of shipwrecks out there, uh, and you know, there's just so many. There's so many different things. I, I, the history of Adelaide is actually quite fascinating. I mean, you know, I think I've told you this. I got into a bit of trouble up in Handorf because I found out there was a Nazi party up there, but I wanted to find out more. But of course, I couldn't because it's all closed down. You can't, <laughs> you know. But apparently, in the early thirties, there was a Nazi party up there. Wow! Yeah, there I you mean, go. That, see, that's a story. You see, that's a, that's mm. a, that's the subject of a drama or of a play. I mean, they're about to do the Yvonne Corley, uh, Yvonne Gulagong story at the South Australian Theatre Company, which is brilliant. And I think that's why history is important. And and, and it, it's very difficult to teach Australian history, though, especially in schools, because it's so violent and it's so um, uh, sexual, if you like, because it's you're dealing mm. with a lot of... You know, even though Adelaide prizes itself on no convicts, it doesn't mean that you didn't have a whole lot of salubrious, you know, characters running around during the gold rush and things like that. You did. And um, so, mm. and it's pretty raw. It's pretty rough. But I find it quite exciting, actually. But isn't that the same with all histories? I mean, we've got a very, very short history. So does it become more focused because we can see it in such a short period in, in other countries and other worlds over the hundreds of years? It's history can be a terrible thing but we learn from that and the idea is not to cover up history but to actually learn from it and make stories of it isn't it oh absolutely there's the, what is called the santiana principle um, of history those who ignore the lessons of the past are condemned to repeat it i think unfortunately mm. we do see that especially i think in the handling of the land is um and i found that with um uh, the whole covid pandemic when the covid pandemic hit um, and I do think Nicholas Spurrier and Stephen Marshall led us through three years, of, especially Nicholas Spurrier, through quite a difficult time. Uh, you know, we mm -hmm. had three days of lockdown. Melbourne had nine months. I mean, you know, we didn't have people being buried in the middle of our parklands like happened in New York. So yes, we came out of this thing pretty, pretty well, and um, which I'm very grateful for. But uh, what was it? It's, it's, it's I, I kind of when it started going, I'm going. It, it, haven't we been through this before? And it was because I was remembering what it was like in the 90s going through when AIDS first hit and the mm -hmm. HIV, HIV pandemic, pandemic. And it was the same level of misinformation, the same sort of hysteria, the same thing about, oh, it's just it's, it's a gay disease, so we don't need to worry about it. Or And you know how people were walking around with COVID saying, oh, it's just the flu. And I'm kind of going mm -hmm. to my gay friends going, we've been through this. We've been through all this before. Yeah. And, uh, but we haven't learned from it. And I so no. I found all that issue of the inf misinformation, and I just found it quite disturbing that we actually haven't changed so much. In fact, I think it got worse because of social media, uh, with that spread of of things and people getting so angry. 
uh, about it all. I'm going, this is not the way to work through this mm. with, of dealing with plagues. And so that's the other thing how, of regarding history can teach you. How do you deal with a plague? And there's, you know, the history of mankind is full of all these things. So I, I but I, I, I just think it's also one of the most important things for actors is to keep, is to inspire your imagination. And you've got to feed your imagination. If you wish to grow as an actor, you've got to continually feed your imagination. And that history, art galleries, going to see movies, going, stepping out of your comfort zone. I, um, I, I mean, I'm talking to just, just recently, uh, if you can afford it, go, have you ever seen an opera? La Traviata is on at the moment. Mm. Great opera. If you've never seen an opera, that's a great one to begin with. Go and see it if you can afford to go. To, and it's expensive, but um, it's things like that. It's just constantly mm. expand your imagination. That's how you're going to improve as an actor. And I've, and I've been doing that, and I've, I've been to a couple of um, Mark Clements and Stephanie Rossi's plays that you're um, a co-producer with their uh, Stark Productions. That's correct, isn't it? And you direct their plays. And so I've, I've got along to support them. And it's, it's so different to be able to see stuff on, on stage. And as I said before, I went to Tasmania and saw my first Shakespeare play. And I, I can see that I need to do a lot more of it. And I'm looking forward to my retirement so my wife and I can go and do that. Because not just for my acting background, but just my culture in itself is going to be so much. It's the fact that you actually went to the Midsummer Night's Dream and rather it being a terrible experience, which it could have been, it was a great experience. And so your desire to go and see more, you're an actor, mm. you're, of course it's going to happen. Of course it's going to happen, you know, because it's Shakespeare and it's like brilliant. But the very fact that you actually have got that desire, that means it's worked. That means something, something's been ignited inside mm. you that you know and you're going to pursue it. That's so good. I mean, as mm. a teacher, as a director, you know, when that happens, you go, OK, that's I've done my job. Something's, mm. something's worked here because. And I like the idea um, of seeing how people, um, in, both in Shakespeare or, or just a movie or stories, how characters are different and people are different. And we were touching on before with the COVID, how it's changed the culture a little bit. Uh, you know, I work at an airport and um, the difference in people today compared to three years ago people are angrier and people are more concerned about their, their own welfare that they'll step over people now so to speak because i don't know whether that's changed covid's changed people and that that will change our stories as well won't it i agree with you david i've noticed this as certain this i mean it's balanced you also there's great acts of kindness as well but i've noticed there's a there's a heightened anger i think the issue of climate change is adding to it as well mm. um, you just have to look at you know the Europe in Europe all the rivers are drying up. It's anybody who says there's no climate change I think is an idiot because there are major problems with it all now. Yes. We don't know the full impact of it all. But I do I I, I I I'm planning to come off social media again soon as I often do. I find social media very very distressing. Um, you need it as a necessary evil to communicate and to promote shows. But boy, you know it can be toxic. Like it's toxic. I don't like it also mm. what it does to me personally. I notice I mean, you all laugh at me because you're wonderful friends, but how I, you know, am I ranting? But it's um, but I then I look at it and go, God, Tony, really? You know, why why are you so angry? Just get off the damn thing, you know, and go and read a book because uh, I, 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 and I'm sure you've seen it. At, I've avoided airports. I, I've I've mm. been driving because I partly because I don't want to be involved. I've also I've noticed that. People are reluctant to go to the theatre. There's, I mean, there's a real push to try and get people back into the theatre, but it's so expensive now. It's mm. really expensive, and you've got always going to be have the problem about COVID or flu or something. And yes, I have noticed a there's a there is a, a, a cutting quality of sort of like no, I'm all right, and in order to be all right, I've got to cut people off. I think I do. Yeah, it it's sad. I think, mm. I think I do it myself a little bit, not necessarily mm. rudely, but it's more. I mean, I am immune compromised and I am 65, so I am in that age group where I've really got to be careful. That of I course. And, uh, and I think it has reduced, resulted in a distancing. Mm. Well, let's, let's move away from that COVID uh, morbid discussion and I, I'm mindful of time. I just wanted to bring it quickly back to, um, to acting and start to wind up. Uh, now, you've recently spoke... Um, uh, at, uh, with Flinders in part of the English and Creative Writing Seminar Series. Uh, you're doing a PhD at Flinders on Richard Burbage, Shakespeare's actor in The Art of Personation. 
Yeah. Um, now, I've read a little bit into it, and um, it sounds absolutely awesome. Can you just give us a bit of a background? What what you're writing there and what, uh, what you're seeing from that, uh, from Ri- uh, Richard Burbage in well, the I've, acting world? I've always been fascinated with Richard Burbage because he stands there as this sort of mystery. <clears throat> because like, just like Shakespeare, we don't know very much... We know certain things about him, but we don't really know a lot. But yes, at the same time, Richard Burbage is possibly, and this is part of my premise, is, um, is possibly the greatest actor that the world has ever known because all these roles were written for him, uh, mm. which is Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear, or, I mean, and not just Shakespeare, but lots of, there's virtually every other dramatist were writing for Richard Burbage. And so, and what's strange, after 400 years, these roles, many of them, are still being performed. Now, no other actor can cl- say that, has got a, such mm. a legacy. Um, and so it's quite unique. But, what, but he sits there as a mystery. Who is this guy? What was he like who inspired the other writers, like Shakespeare, to write Hamlet, to write Macbeth, Othello, Lear? I mean, virtually all of them. And so I'm exploring this, this issue of him, of trying to work out exactly what he did. Now, to personate... Uh, personation. That was what was called his style of acting, which really develops in the 1590s. And it, essentially, it's about it's a combination of two things. And when you think about a character like Richard III or Othello, it's involving the complete immersion of the actor, the complete transformation of the actor into a character. Very much in the way that we talk about how we talk about hey, Gary Oldman in Dangerous Hours, uh, Dan- well, Darkest Hours, or um, Daniel Day Lewis in Lincoln, where you, or even mm. Wall Street. This type of actor, we want to see them transform. We know they're transforming. It's self-conscious. But we, that's what we love about them, uh, is that they will you know, twist their bodies and their voices and their whole things into a different shape. Shape-shifting, if you like. And so that's, that's very much Burbage. Uh, the other side about him is this issue of he was praised for doing it so truly to life, which is a bit awkward because you go, OK... We can't have an any. We don't have any images of um, uh, what he was like in performance. Well, glimpses, written glimpses. But there is what I call globe-style naturalism. It's, yes. You wouldn't call it sort of twenty-first-century naturalism, but it's associ- it's associated with the dynamics of that particular stage, which is three-dimensional. It's not like working on a proscenium march. You've got audiences on three sides, and so the actors wow. work in a very particular way. Um, the expression of human emotion, uh, which is the playwrights, um, which we still use, we use to define em- the expression of emotions today. Not necessarily in Shakespearean, la- the Shakespearean language, but Shakespeare articulates feelings uh, and emotions for the first time. But we still use these things. And it's very interesting regarding concepts of masculinity, um, which, of course... Is, I mean, this is where it gets really scary because I can't, but we do define issues of masculinity partly through Shakespeare. Uh, mm-hmm. What is like a, a Mac, you know, Macbeth is a bad tyrant, you know, and beset with witches and things like that, and um, or the hero such as like an Antony or or Henry V. We do define, we still work with these definitions of masculinity, um, which is can be problematic because. Like, and one of the things I'm concentrating on at the moment is uh, the Burbage role, if you like, uh, and its relationship with women. Basically, it's hostile. It's ex- mm. and it would be called extremely misogynistic, and it is. It is. Uh, yet, at the same time, there's something else going on, which is, because this is the idea of men taming women. We're expected to keep women in control, um, like the taming of a shrew. But okay. when you start looking at what Burbage's relationships are with the female characters are, uh, and the things like a Hamlet or any of them really, is it's it, it, regarding taming women, it's a spectacular failure time and time again. And so I'm questioning going, is this deliberate? Are they, deli- mm. are they do- deliberately actually setting something up to say how we, pro- how, how we deal with women, even in this period, because it all, they all fail. Every, t- every time the, uh, a Burbage character tries to tame a woman, it's a failure. It ends in disaster. Completely. People don't... Maybe that says something about women over the, over the times then. That... <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean... It, so That's good. 
there's lots of questions. Whether I come up with actually definite answers, I'm still in that process. So I'm doing all this and, and forming questions going, well, why is this like this? Why is, what's this? And, um, and it's fascinating how certain things come into play. There are glimpses of him in action. There is such as when Banquo's ghost appears, um, there's a glimpse of him, what, how he did, what he did, which was turn and drop a cup. I mean, it's a small physical gesture, but you just get a hint because that's not in the script. And you're going, oh, mm. so that's what he originally, he was holding a glass, he sees Banquo's ghost and he drops it. That's a Burbage invention. And I'm looking for little things like that so I can try and get a hold on him. Uh, I think he's a very physical actor, extremely physical. And that, once again, the whole training of actors. So he, would, he could, you know, he, could, he was obviously really good at weaponry extremely good at it actually and uh as well as handling massive amounts of verse a huge memory uh wow because i mean how many characters would he have had in his brain at one point massively so, so, so certainly something why, yeah certainly something for all actors to will be able to would take something away from that i think so because even it's, today it's, it's the birth of what we call the english acting legacy so it's the birth of what mm. we understand and the very fact that it's still being done after 400 mm. odd years because of all these roles still being done. So I do believe that every time anybody gets up there and does anything like a transformation or like a um, like Hamlet, is there's a little bit of Richard Burbage in there, always. Awesome, awesome. And, and how far away are you away from uh, completing that? Oh, about another year when I get time to do it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And that'll be available for people to read when you are finished? Oh, they, yeah. they publish those, don't they? Yeah, and then there's the idea of turning it into a book, actually, a proper book. Which or I'm a movie. Doing. Or a movie. Or I a love movie. it. <laughs> All right, Tony, I, I think we uh, we could talk for another hour, and I reckon um, if you're up for it, that uh, maybe in season two next year we'll bring you back and, um, and we talk again. I just want to end uh, quickly, um, I call it the fast round uh, or quick questions. Uh, I'm just going to throw at you and then we'll um, let you go. Uh, what's your, what would be your T-shirt quote? If you were to get a shirt, what quote would you have on your T-shirt? Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> Love it. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and um, Ed, I, I wanted to ask this one. Do you have a favourite monologue or a favourite scene um, that – that you like yourself or that you like actors, like to see actors perform? Yes, I do, actually. Well, I've got a number of them. One I, of um, one I like very much is a, from an obscure play called Life is a Dream by Calderon de la Barca. And it comes at the, it's one of the Spanish classical pieces. And it's about, um, it's the, it's the, in the Spanish classical theatre, it's their equivalent of to be or not to be. And... Uh, it's about how we, our, life, our life is like a dream, essentially. We imagine things. We think we have one idea of reality, but then it can turn and it's not real. And so this issue of truth and illusion, which comes into Hamlet as well, of course, but I, that's one of my favourite speeches ever. It's, the, it's, it's called the Life is a Dream speech. Being awesome. I'll, right. I'll be looking that up for sure. And I had a question here. Are you binging anything on TV? But I think you've already mentioned that, uh, the Stranger Things and... Uh, well, I've just uh, watched a couple Catherine. others. I've just watched Catherine, Catherine the Great, um, because okay. Tony, Mac because Tony McNamara wrote it, and straight in writer and director, and he's responsible for it all. And uh, look, it's irrelevant, it's stupid, it's but wonderfully entertaining. So I awesome. actually quite enjoyed those two seasons. Yeah. Cool. Uh, is there anything you think we've uh, we've missed? That's probably a silly question because I think we've probably missed heaps. Um, Why did you call this the late bloomer actor? Because. Uh, I'm the late bloomer actor. I um, I was, it was, came across as a branding sort of thing. Um, I, I had an opportunity to um to go and work with um a film and television school in Melbourne. They they were running out of here in Adelaide, and I actually won a scholarship with them. Um, so I tried to raise some uh, some funds just to help out because I wasn't in a position, and I called it the late bloomer actor. That was my uh. Uh, fundraising so and the crew at Type Talent um, invited me in once for one of their talk sessions as an actor and they brought it up as when they were talking about branding so when I wanted to do a podcast there it goes that was my uh, brand for my podcast so uh, I started out doing the podcast as um, 
to, to meet other late bloomer actors and to bring in industry guests. I'm leaning towards now being my journey as a late bloomer acting and learning from others and what I've learned from people like yourself. So, so that's what it is. I think it's great. I Thank you. It's, it's, no, I really do. Because um, there's actually, David, you're not alone. There's a lot of what would be called late bloomer actors, a lot. Mm. Um, there's, and very good ones who actually, you know, basically don't start until their late 30s. Or they've got and I'm surprised, and that's what I'm looking for because you know, acting itself is—it doesn't matter when you start. There can be so many tr troughs in your journey, so many down moments where you just go, "Can I cut it? Am I cutting it?" And and even today, you've you've elated me, lifted me to know that I'm on the right journey, I'm on the right path, and I'm learning the right things, and I'm, I'm getting what I want. And that's what I want to um, bring to my listeners and to other actors is that to keep striving for what you want to uh, reach and, and, and you'll make it. Do you know one thing I've noticed and talking to young people at the moment, which is full of anxiety. I mean, they're very full of anxiety, actually. Mm, it's it's sad. It's, yeah, because of partly what's happened with COVID. And mm. I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if numbers go down a little bit regarding acting, uh, becoming actors, because they're very aware of the precariousness of the, of the, um, of the profession and they're not sure if they want to go down that path, which I understand mm. completely. And I do say, well, you can do both. You can, you, if you get a job as a teacher or something like that, qualifications, it's, you can still act. But these days in many ways, yes, you do need to have a backup of something to do because it's hardly Definitely. has a profession, but it doesn't stop you. But I'm just very aware that there, there's a frightened quality but I also turn around and say and I'm sure you understand this about a nervousness or a restlessness and that we're always full of self-doubt we're always full of self-doubt that's part of it it's how we it's how we live with that self-doubt mm. I mean I know with Steph and Mark and myself we're always going oh god is this going to work and I think we always do and um but it's how we actually negotiate that and not allow yes. doubt to dominate um, because if we allow the self-doubt to dominate, then we stop being active. And it's always about the doing. And yes. But I do think it's actually part of it, more and more. And I know young people look at me going, but how do you live with that? And I go and go, well, well I've lived with it for 60-odd years. I have no idea, but I've managed to actually <laughs> deal with it. But do I get paranoid? Do I get nervous about it? Um, fearful? Yeah, of course. Mm. But I, is that the buzz? Is that part of the buzz? I don't know. I think, mm. you know, I think it's, well, it's, it's life in general, isn't it? About how you overcome all that as well and, and move forward. But I'm talking about performance, specifically in doing, of getting okay. up there and, and actually getting up there and, and doing something in front of some, um, somebody else or creating a work. Mm. That there's always this, you kind of go, well, why am I doing it? And, you know, sometimes I don't know. I'll be the first to admit, I don't know why I do, I'm mm. doing things. I just do it. But I don't actually think too much that's what i did say to they look, these young people looking going looking at me curiously and i'm going well, i'm trying to i'm seeing remote 65 i'm still working it out <laughs> you know? maybe that's it I don't know. all right right okay awesome i think i think we've got uh, we can do their whole next episode of a podcast on that alone i think that's uh, awesome uh tony thank you very much this has been absolutely brilliant um I, i'm so excited to have you on board and to hear from what you've what you know from acting and history and everything about it we, i think we've only just just touched on the baseline of of your knowledge and your background and it's great what you have brought to the australian acting community and and the people you've brought up and it's such a wonderful asset to south australia that you're here now and you're teaching with so many different um classes and and a couple of the schools here and, and, and passing your knowledge on to everyone here in south australia so i love it Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thank you. Right. Cheers. We'll, we'll see you on set, as I like to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. All right. All right.